for Nigeria's democracy is a story containing a series of events that can only be covered in a many season series, at least 10 seasons with 12 episodes each. We get bits and pieces of the story when we meet guests like the one I have on the show today. But it's a story that has come to mind in recent times as we look at political developments across Africa. Coups are here again. And this time, many believe the motivations are still the same, even though they come under a different set of circumstances. The newly elected 44-year-old president of Senegal has initiated conversations about Africa's young men and women and what roles they play in governance. Hello and welcome to Political Paradigm on Channels Television. I am Kayla Megwa. Today on the program, we ask what is happening to Africa's democracy, evolution or death? And here to give us some clarity is a man who was part of Nigeria's fight for democracy and went to jail for three years for his convictions. Join us as we welcome Mr. Frederick Ennott to the program. He is a consultant for the United Nations, but he used to be the special advisor to the resident coordinator of the UN in Nigeria. He's a journalist, pro-Africanist, crisis communications expert, commentator, chef, and former special assistant to the late M.K. Owabiola. Mr. Frederick Eno, welcome to Political Paradigm. Thank you, Kayla. It's it's such a you. long introduction. I know. There's a lot about you. <laughs> I thought I was just Fred. <laughs> <laughs> You're not just, that's a trick with you, Mr. Eno. You try to make it look like I'm just Fred. Now there's more to you. Them than friend? being just Fred. Yes, indeed. And I'm going to get into the reason why there's more to you. Many people do not know who you are. Many young people don't know your story. Maybe I'm too old. No, you're not too old. I think you just <laughs> decided to lurk in the dark for a little bit. But I'm going to open up a little bit about that. Good. Let's go back to a date that I know you would never forget. August the 19th, 1994. Correct. Walk us through the events of that day. Oof. I think interesting because I had a normal day briefing the media, talking about why the June 12 elections needed to be realized as the day Nigerians expressed and talking about democracy is still considered to be the freest and fairest elections. And I had the responsibility of making sure the hope of restoring that elections were kept alive because I was convinced that we could realize that hope. Um, and so I had briefed the media, and I had an appointment with journalists from the international media at the Lagos Sheraton Hotel. But just so, so we can get some context, at the time, the June 12th elections had just been annulled. You're talking 1994? Yes, 94. No, the elections were annulled in 93. They were annulled in 93? Yes. Okay, so by this, after the annulment, you were a special assistant to lead MK Abiola. Yes. And you were, you, still, you were still carrying on the, we need to get the results of June 12 to be uh, the, the government of the day. We need to be able to get that to be the legal government of the day. That, am I getting that correct? You're getting it correct to the extent that you're using the term legal. We were convinced that our elections had occurred, a winner emerged, and that winner needed to take the rightful place as the elected president. And so from June 23rd, 1993, the day of the annulment, until August 19, 1994, we had kept on that struggle. Of course, you know what happened in between that time with General Abacha coming to power and all of that. And so if you ask me what I did on that day, that's what I was doing. And General Abacha was in power at Yeah, he time. was. He was. He had been in power since... So uh, you were going to meet the media. I think I remember the story. You were going to the Sheraton in yes, Lagos yes. to go meet the media. Yeah, I had an appointment with a correspondent from the New York Times, a correspondent from Newsweek, and a correspondent from the uh, uh, London Guardian. Now, what had transpired is that earlier that evening, at about 5.30 p.m., Chief Anthony and Nahoro... General Akin Rinade and Chief Cornelius Adebayo had been picked up. So there was a frenzy of knowing who and where this elder statesmen were. And so there was quite an anticipation from this journalist that I would have a word or two to say about, because there was still 
unclarity as to whether they were arrested or not. So the, I, it's just so people can get some context, because a lot of people were not around around that time, <laughs> just so they can understand what this means. So they were being arrested and charged with treason. I think that was, that was what everyone was being charged with at the time. Well, as at that time, nobody knew... Why? Why they were being arrested. So all they know is, okay, so there's a military government and they're picking up these people who were part. Was oh. it was it Nadeko they were picking or just anyone who was affiliated with the MK Abiola movement? Anyone who was, who was affiliated towards the realization of democracy in the country. And I don't want to say Nadeko because the hundreds of young people who were murdered in cold blood on the streets of Lagos. And we're living at a time when you wake up in the morning and you find 50, 60 bodies floating on a lagoon. These were not Nadeko. These were young Nigerians who felt their country needed them and they stood up and stood out and were on the streets every day. So that was my day's job. And I walked into the Sheraton, uh, into the foyer of the Sheraton at about 7.15 p.m. And some of this correspondence of those different uh, global media houses were people I knew. They were friends of mine. So they recognized me as I walked in and approached me. So we're literally standing in the middle of the hotel when a small group of men started crowding around us. And... Uh, they then approached us and asked if I was Fred Eno, and I said yes. And they said I was uh, under arrest, and I said, who by? They said, on instructions of the head of state. I'm like, the head of state knows me? <laughs> Why would he want to arrest me? But unfortunately, we couldn't continue that conversation, because from that moment on, uh, they pulled out their guns, and I was escorted to waiting cars outside, and they drove off. So what happened afterwards? <laughs> because people just see the, <laughs> when they pick you up. Because as a kid, I remember, especially people from the academia were yeah. really being arrested. Yes, and, and we quite grew up, a few. I grew up with the academia. Yeah. So w what we would see is that they've picked this person and then we just won't see the person again. Sometimes you will hear the person has died. Yes. And then other times they'll come back after 10 years, five years. So what happened after you were arrested? Well, I was taken to a detention facility called Shangisha in the outskirts of Lagos. I got there, and that's where I discovered this is where Chief Enahoro, John Akin Rinade, and Chief Cornelius Adebayo had been kept, so I was put into a room with them uh, to move things forward. From that point on, at about 5.30 in the morning, they showed up, picked me in a car, drove off to the airport, I was put in a nice plane, really nice. It was a Falcon, I remember. It was, it was aircraft, a Falcon. <laughs> presidential jet. <laughs> you know, and was spanking new. I mean, you could smell it. But um, in the course of the night, I think that's when I got a clear idea of the enormity of what was going on. Because I spent this time with these elder statesmen who, you know, I remember Chief Anaura saying to me, Fred, my son, uh, this is going to be a long ride. Do you have a toothbrush? And I was like, Chief, what are you talking about? I, as far as I was concerned, first, they could not hold this caliber of people. And then secondly, I think I just felt, I was so convinced about the rightness, the correctness, the, the justness of our cause that I thought no sane human being, be it a president or a head of state or general or whatever, could really not see the futility of putting the future of a country by truncating an election of this caliber. So I was a bit not as worried as this older man who knew or could understand you know, um, what we were dealing with, better than I did, and for good reason. And so, when I was separated from them and then taken to the airport and flown to Abuja, 
it started occurring to me that I'm onto something even bigger here. It's not that what we're doing, I mean, I did what I was doing, what I had to do. But it was when we got to Abuja and I was taken to the detention facility uh, of the DSS in Asokoro that I knew that this was getting a bit more. Because on that flight, actually, they had brought Chief, late Chief Kokori and may he rest in peace. And um, Prince Adeniji Adele, they had picked them up that same night. So we're flown to Abuja together and taken to the DSS uh, detention facility here where we're kept in separate cells. Now, for the three months or thereabout in the DSS cell in Abuja, you didn't have a bath, you didn't have a change of clothes, you didn't have a toothbrush, you didn't have, so you stayed with what you had for three months, and so it was nice. I got a, I mean, any perfume I buy now that has an odor close to what I smelt like, I buy it for any price. But, yeah, so that's how that transition happened. And from then on, you were moved to the conventional prisons. You were moved from the DSS facility to Enugu? Yeah. Yeah, again, we're flown, I understand. Uh, they moved the others to Kaduna and to Bama, and then I was taken to a new, it was at night, so I got there and literally didn't know where I was. How many years did you spend in uh, Enugu? In Enugu, I spent uh, a year and 10 months. And, you know, it's, it's still one of the most, when I think about it, I think that's what's defined me as a person, because it was in Enugu that uh, the last three months of the late General Shehu Mushaya Radua's life was spent, and we shared the same prison cell. So when I look at some of the things happening in the country today and the conversations I used to have with him, particularly about the North, because I I've spent the last few years of my working life spending so much time in the North. So I reflect a lot on the conversations I was having with General Yanadwa. That must have been something. No, it was. And, you know, we're talking about young people and all of those things, and I'm looking at this men we're talking about today look like they're dinosaurs. But these guys were running this country at ages below 40. And I get into trouble with my younger friends because I tell them, I'm sorry, guys. This is not about age. The guys who defined this country and did great things for this country did so when they were below 40. Chief Enahu, I'm talking to you about, he stood up in the old colonial parliament at age 26 and told the Brits that we can govern ourselves. So young people of Nigeria, just wake up. Just wake up. Yeah, they say nobody gives you power, but I don't even have to think of, if somebody gives you power, take it. But don't wait to be given. We're going to get to young people, because of course... Uh, it's, it's, it's critical. It's, it's a very crucial part of today's conversation. How long did you spend incarcerated? In total? In total, two years and two months. Two years and two months? Yeah. What, what happened when you got out? Interesting. I, it's, it's a story I'm still struggling. I've met a few of the guys who arrested us. You have? Yeah. And, you know, hey, listen, life goes on. But it's interesting because certain things happened that precipitated the, the release. Part of it was also that the late Kudi Ratabiola had been assassinated on June 4th, 1996. Now, this is a woman I respected so much and worked very closely with. 
in the process of the struggle. In fact, I think at some point in this story, from the little I know about your history, yeah. that day she told you not to leave the house. In fact, you showed up at her house. Yeah. You showed up at her house on that August 19th. Yeah. And she told you to leave. Actually, she told you to hide or something. Uh, it, was, it was dangerous. People were getting arrested. But you insisted that you wanted to go and see your media friends at Sheraton. In, well, in, in I, I mean, you can say insist. Is this true? It is true to the extent that first she was shocked to see that I could show up at her residence uh, at that time because she had concluded that hearing the arrest of Chief and now and all the others, whom she knew I was very loyal to and depended so much on their guidance as to some of the things I said to the world. Because I would sit down with them and they say, okay, this is where we are. These are the things we think the world needs to know. And then I'll go and broadcast it. So I guess with their arrest and then she not having heard or seen from me for most of the day, and then to see me show up at her living room, and she was like, what are you, do are you mad? What are you doing here? She's already looking for people to take me to the border with Kotonuo and all of that. I'm like, we called her Mama Leko. I said, Mama Leko, I have journalists waiting for me at Sheraton. I have. And she got even crazier. I'm like, you must be very, I will tell your mother. You know, that kind of, <laughs> <laughs> you know, but yeah, she was. She was um, angry felt I was taking a risk that she wasn't um, uh, comfortable with and that I should not uh, make myself um, to be seen publicly again and that I'll be more useful. So yes, she, she, but yeah, that's how that came up. And so with her fatal assassination, uh, the government kind of used my closeness to her to say, oh, well, listen, uh, one of her closest people, we've released him, uh, so why should we want to kill her when we are releasing her? And so they were using that, and I was supposed to be was, moved. Was some kind of propaganda. Yeah. I mean, so I was supposed to be moved from one place to the other. That's why the whole issue of how the release came about became another story. Some, some claim that an order was given from Abuja that I be moved from Enugu to Port Harcourt prison. Others said I'd been given a conditional release to either go to Calabar or come to my house in Lagos. And so I remember this set of guys coming to the prison and I was invited to the prison controller's office and uh, he said, sign this. I'm like, what am I signing? He said, well, you're no longer in my custody. I've been told to release you. And then there were three gentlemen sitting down there. Well, I signed it. I had nothing but my flip-flops and, you know, a small plastic bag. Because I was told to take my belongings. I wonder what belongings did I have in prison. I had a Bible. I had a bit of a rasta hair. I mean, I was not, not always like this, you know. But I had... And they said, sign, and I signed. And so here I was, and the three gentlemen signed the thing as well, saying they had supervised my release, but didn't know what to do with me after that. So there were those who said they were supposed to take me to Port Harcourt prison because it was a transfer and not a release. I was being released from Enugu prison to be taken somewhere else. It looks like the guys who were there did not have for their instructions. So we got out of the prison gate and they got into their pickup truck and drove off. And left you standing there? And I'm standing there. So one of the prison wardens came to me and said, uh, Mr. Fred, I said, yeah, go. <laughs> I'm like, what do you mean go? He said, you won't go back. I said, make you go. So I looked at the guy. So the first instinct I had then was, okay, this is Enugu. Nobody knows I'm out. I looked really... So I took a motorbike. I asked the guy. Somebody there gave me 10 naira, you know, the prison guys. He said, where do you want to go? I said, do you know where Concord office is? Concord Press. 
They say, yes, that place where they give newspaper. I think when papers arrive, vendors go collect. He said, yes. So I climbed on the Okada with my little plastic bag. And he took me to the Concord Press Office. The poor Enugu uh, bureau chief or correspondent at the time. So I got to the office. And when I walked in, the secretary looked at me like some crazy guy who's just staggered into the office. He said, ah, Oga never come. And I'm seeing the guy sitting in his office. He said, I beg, go. I said, listen, just don't worry, madam. Just let me. So I walked into his office and closed the door. It's when we made eye contact, then he then looked at me. Now, Mr. Fred, Mr. Fred, is it you? Because, you know, I'd smuggled a letter that incriminated the prison officers who killed a young prisoner in my presence in Enugu prison. That led to the arrest of prison officers. And Concord and a few other papers had published it. So he kind of was like, what do we? So he got through to Lagos and confirmed to his uh, uh, colleagues in Lagos that I was actually sitting in the office and um, they were thinking of what to do. Uh, I then had access to the phone now and then I called uh, my elder sister who was in Lagos to let her know I was there. She had a friend in Enugu, they were at UNN together, who then rushed to that office, picked me up and took me to her house. And this poor woman was shaking like a chicken. It's like, what do I do with you? You sitting here and you're telling me you're not sure whether they released me. And she could not tell whether I escaped as well and all of that. And, you know, my elder sister showed up later that evening from Lagos and, uh, you know, I mean, after, after your release, you, you still had to leave the country. Yeah, I, I did. Think. You lived around Africa for, for a bit. No, well, three and days. And then you moved to the U.S. No, three days after my release, I was in Cameroon. Okay. Because I went to Calabar, of course, and uh, saw my mom. And by the time the emotions were getting really high, I got wind of the fact that, sorry, you were not really released. You had to be transferred. <laughs> <laughs> so I had to transfer myself uh, through several nice routes to Cameroon, where I um, then took refuge and was given refugee papers after a while, and then left and uh, went back to the States. It's quite a story. <laughs> I want to be able to get how, you know, what it was like working with with the late M.K. Abiola, you were his special assistant. What, 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 was, what was your work like? And what was it like working with him? No, I mean, the, the, the point is, a lot of people had assumed that I just dropped into the Hope 93 campaign and all of that. I had actually worked um, both beginning as a staff writer, reporter, for African Concord magazine in London from 1986. And so one of my earlier, or my earliest encounters with him, I mean, I was reporting or writing for the magazine, but I'd written a story about the killing of um, a South African activist who was an ANC ambassador in Paris, a wonderful lady called Dulcie September. Now, Dulcie was shot on the streets of Paris by the apartheid uh, Gestapo. And so I wrote that story and then ended up discovering that the actual assassins had killed her in Paris and then moved to London. And so in the report, I indicated that the MI6 actually either knew who the killers of Dulcie September were or were part of the plan. Now that brought them to the office and I remember the editor of African Concord at the time um, Tunde Akbabiaka, you know, walked into the office like, what have you done? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, and so I think a month or so later, MQ Abiola came to London and came to the office. And our, the African Concord offices were at the basement of this building. 
so I heard this husky voice coming down the stairs. Hey, see the one? See the one who brought the people to his office? Ah, you are so young. Uh-uh. Come, okay. Come to the house after this. Come to the house and see me. You know, so from that point on, we kind of, you know, the, 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 the relationship moved beyond just uh, reporting for the magazine, but he would come to London at different times and would ask me to come and I'll sit down and listen to him and just getting to understand exactly where this man's inspiration came from, which had nothing to do with money. You know, like he would tell me all the time, say, Fred, Freddy, my son, a dog can have money. What you do with it, how it reflects in your engagement with a larger society you meet, poor, rich, powerful, weak. And so by the time we were part of what then transpired to be his 50th birthday celebration, which he decided to organize the first Pan-African conference on the food crisis in Africa, 1987. And what he did just changed my entire perspective. He brought, if you were African and you had 20 PhDs in food culture, food systems, agro-industrialization, come. Wherever you are in the world, come. And brought political leaders, and then brought a huge Pan-African following to it. So we had the Molefia Santes, the Jesse Jacksons, the, the uh, uh, Margaret Vogt, may she rest in peace. We brought everybody into that one conference and said, Africans must stop this. Because, you know, we're coming two years after the Great Ethiopian Famine. And so he took that and said, let's talk. This is not just about food. It's about who we are. So it kind of changed how you... It changed completely. Because and, that's, so, and then you joined the, the Hope 93 campaign. Well, the Hope 93, that's what I'm saying. That came much, much later. Mm -hmm. So I'd followed him through this. Mm -hmm. He's a, I moved from London to the United States to set up the Concord Press office after that. What, what did you, what did you, you, you were meeting with the press. Was it a special advisor, media? Is that what, is that the kind of job we're talking about here? With Hope 93? Well, with him, generally, I no, think. No, I was a correspondent you were, you were for the Concord, for the, Concord. Press, for the African Concord well, magazine. you were working with him. Yeah, I mean, we did a whole lot more than the magazine. That was his life. Yes. You know, and, I mean, when you think about it, that Moshud Abiola, an African, became the grand patron of the Congressional Black Caucus of the United States Congress and was one of the key sponsors of the annual... Congressional Black Caucus Conventions. When you think about it, and then see how the whole thing about the reparations movement came about, and the constitution of the eminent persons group on reparations. So he did a lot more. So I was doing a lot more than just learning of who this man was, but absorbing so much of what drives me today as an African. What drives me today of thinking that the, 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 you see, I, I gave a paper somewhere which I called the Nigerian promise. It's not a Nigerian dream. It's a promise. It's a promise about this country that every Nigerian must fulfill that promise, not just to Nigeria, but to the continent of Africa and to every African who finds himself wherever they are in the world. So two, two events that come to my mind right now, our return to democracy. Yeah. How did you feel about that? <laughs> I mean, to me, the optimism was that these people cannot last. And I'm talking about the military regimes and things like that. So I always knew that the destruction can only last for this long. And I call it a destruction because that's what we're suffering today. So, so when you... I want. I, I don't want to cut you because I want to hear this. <laughs> but mm. when you with with everything that happened, 
you just described the military rule as the destruction. Yeah. For many people that didn't experience it, you still you hear those sentiments in parts of even Nigeria mm -hmm. and in parts of Africa. Mm -hmm. We've seen the return of coups. Yeah. You hear some Nigerians romanticize <laughs> military <laughs> regimes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. They, but, but they brought development. Oh, what, they built roads. What's that? What's that got to do? And, you know, sometimes you want to be able to... What, were they, what else were what, they supposed what, to do? Do you know what you had to give up? I think people play with the concept of freedom. Do, do you get that sense as I, well? I, I do get it. I do get it. Because no matter how many good roads you have and how much electricity you have, if you don't have freedom, <laughs> you, you, would, you, would, you would be angry at the roads. You know, you will know, you will know what freedom really means when it's taken away from you. I can say that, you know. But I know that post-colonial Africa and then single-party systems and then military regimes and then military coups, uh, as you mentioned, is returning now and all of that. But I think being Nigeria-specific, seeing the number of coups we had, seeing the number of military rulers we had, and if you just look at our civil service, which I think is the most destroyed of all government institutions of this country. You know, there are countries, if you go to India, as an example, a little civil servant, he could be level six, level eight. If this is what he's supposed to do, you come as minister triple fold. That civil servant will tell you that the rules does not permit me to do this. Try to imagine layers of that kind of destruction that has taken place in the civil service because of what the military had to do to retain power and do the things they did. And so the civil service today has become, you know, our biggest albatross. And that cuts across. You see the judiciary, you see it in... So, so... When people romanticize with it, yeah, we can say all sorts of things because we now have, forgive me for saying so, politicians who are a product of that terrible system. And so you can easily say, well, if those politicians don't know anything, they can get away and we will get the military back and they think it's a joke. I mean, yeah, some people tell you it's the only institution that has national character. You can say that again. But it might also be because of that that the national character seems to have been so terribly abused. I mean, I, I mentioned General Shio Musa Yaradwar. I mean, may God bless his soul. This guy's notion of what Nigeria meant to him as an Aouza Fulani man was a model that an ethic, Ejaga, Mibibio, Kuo, Ibira, or whatever person in this country would want to take. I, I asked you earlier about um, you know, the return to democracy and how you felt about that. I, I, I did say there were some things that stood out for me that I think would have impacted you. MK Abiola's death, the return to democracy, and then the honor that was given to him by the Buhari administration. Let's begin with the honor. I was lucky a few days ago, I, uh, I ran into uh, Mr. Vice President Babagana Kingibe, and I called him that, and he looked at me and laughed. But on a more serious note, he was elected to that position. The fact that it took us um, onwards of 20, 24 years to, to give that to him, I know those who've questioned whether the recognition of Moshuda Biola as a former president with conferment of GCFR to him and all of that was good enough or was enough. And I tell people there's always a starting point, and I believe this. I am one of those who remains 
and will be eternally confident that the aspirations, the hopes of Moshuda Biola for this country will be realized in my lifetime. What's the ultimate hope? Now, it's a Nigeria where your creed, your religion, your tribe, your tongue will not matter. But the common destiny, the common promise, which I talked about earlier, is what will define us because we have a responsibility, not just for this country, but for the continent and for the African people across the world. So a befitting honor to the late M.K. Abiola. You see, there's no honor that will be befitting for M.K. Abiola till Nigeria realizes its full manifest destiny. Okay, just so we can time ourselves properly. Correct. <laughs> His death. It's a terrible thing. It's a terrible thing because I tell people all the time, I said, it's not, you know, as someone who had known his family and I know what children who had been orphaned because of the death of the man and his wife or the children who had been, and, you know, there are times when you really get angry with this country. And I, and I mean this sincerely. I've been around, I've met children of great statesmen who've been killed or who've passed on and I think we treated Abiola's children very badly as a country. And I mean this. I meet them very regularly and they are normal citizens like us. But people still look at it like, oh, those who want to say, oh, he was a part of the this, he was a... No, we don't have too many leaders who did what they did and sacrificed everything they had for the country and they pass on and you turn around and almost victimize his family. That's not correct. And countries that do that, it's part of, I remember a conversation I had with an elder statesman, he too is late now, the late chief, um, Ezefe. I said, this country just has to come back to some basic truths about itself, our leadership, our political leadership. And those basic truths are clear and evident. Whether it is the way we ended the civil war and people say no victor, no vanquish, but it ended in words only. Whether it's in the way, fast forward, we dealt with Leah Sharibu, and people behave as if it was normal that this number of girls were picked up and one isolated and taken away simply because she was a Christian. And we act as if, oh, we cannot talk about it. It's that deep. And if we don't face those basic truths. So when I talk about Abiola's children, it's not, it's not out of, uh, it's not anger. I'm saying when we ignore those things, it affects our national psyche. You know, so now we move to return to democracy. You know this, and that's where we can come to where we are now uh, with the current administration. You know, in 99, a lot of those who had really done so much felt, listen, this politics, is, uh, the military is going, let them go, and sanity will return to the system. Well, it didn't. Because, yes... With all fairness to General Basanjo, um, his constituency, the military, made sure that he came to power. But if you look across the board of all of those who came to power in 99, very few of those who had sacrificed so much held political positions. Well, isn't that the story of life, though? You can call it the story of life, but it's also the story of life today that this is the first time that a core component of those who fought for the democracy and the freedom of this country are in power. That's why, you know, you can, I don't belong to APC or any party, but I can tell you one thing for sure. Bola Ahmed Tinubu knows where to take this country 
because of the experiences he's had. Oh, Nigerians would not like to hear this. Right they now. may not. Well, understandably, sir. Yes. Their quality of life has diminished. Yeah. It makes no sense to them. Yeah. It's, just, it's natural that Nigerians. No, it's natural would, that they would not. I, I, I didn't want to bring it up, but since, since you went there. Yeah. Is this the way it should have gone? Because this massive reduction in quality of life yeah. has ripple effects. So many people are deteriorating as we speak yes. in a country we're trying to build. Yes. Is that not counterproductive? Should we have waited? Should he have waited? Should other things have been put in place first? Should they have been done gradually? We're grappling right now with a different story. Yeah. The cost of electricity is times three now. Yes. So, so with people who are grappling with everything going on, yes. should other things have been done first before we got here? Like what? I don't know. You don't know. Put, put, put things in place. Because if we're trying to create a system that is at par with other countries, where subsidies are, are minimal, the economic development in those places are nowhere near what we have here. Yes. The infrastructure development in those places yes. are nowhere near. You tell, I can decide not to drive my car, but can I afford transportation? There's no train to take me anywhere. Kayla, you can decide to let the disease fester because it's painful to scrape the wound and treat it properly. We can decide to let the rot of Nigeria fester a bit longer because people think they are pulling through, they are managing. But it takes someone with a deep conviction, a deep belief that this country can and must be better. And that belief doesn't come from winning an election. That belief doesn't come from belonging to a political party. No. That belief has to come from someone who's convinced deeply inside that I'll do this, my family, my people, my citizens will not like it, but as head of this family, I have to take this decision and I'll take it now. Now, how we respond to the different crises that will pop up is where we are as a country today. But that's really not where I want to go. And I, I want your viewers and uh, friends and colleagues and families out there to understand this. To be able to take that kind of a decision you must have existed in an environment and a country and experienced certain things that will condition you to know that when I do this, I will not only get this resource, but I must be bold enough to take the heat that comes with it. There are lots of leaders who will flatter you. Let's, let's see if we can talk a bit more about Africa's democracy, because that was the question we opened up the show with. What is happening to Africa's democracy? There was a poll uh, that was done, I think it was done uh, in 2022. So the countries that we're looking at right now, Guinea, Niger, Burkina Faso, Gabon, Chad, Mali, Sudan, the Gambia, Sao Tome and Principe, some of them have failed coups, but you know, coups are coming back. It's coming back. We had talked earlier about people romanticizing the concept of the military, being able to get us out of the corruption of civilian rule. Now, there is something called the Afrobarometer. Have you heard of this? Mm -hmm. So they did this study where, you know, across, I think, 38 countries in Africa, mm -hmm. where they took a look at people's response to, you know, democratic principles. And they found that the love for democratic principles was actually reducing, mm -hmm. especially in West Africa. Yeah. And people were thinking, oh, the military may be yeah. a, a good option. What, what, what is, what's creating this? The coups across the, the continent, many people have said that it is a cry. This is a scream that Africa's democratic leaders are pretending not to hear. 
they have ruled so poorly that the, an option of, of taking my freedom has become even a better idea for me for governance then, than you, who I am supposed to love. By the way, Kayla, of all of those countries, I've been to all of those countries you mentioned, yes. except uh, Sao Tome and Principe, and it's for not, uh, not for lack of love. But I get it. I get it. And it comes back to what we were talking about a minute ago about, you know, uh, how could Nigerians say the president is right with what we are going through? And that cuts across the continent. The governance challenges we're facing, what people could consider to be dividends of democracy, as we call it here, the, the challenges that are imposed, whether by climate change or whatever else, have all compounded the poor quality of governance across the continent. For West Africa, we have a peculiar situation with the French colonies and all of that. But you see, Kayla, what it is also is that increasingly the disconnect between what you would call elected, quote unquote, elected leadership and the larger populations they govern. Which now means that we also have this series of, we talked about roads and houses and all of that. Invest in people. Invest in those things that, at the very basic level, can give Africans some sense of being a part of what you're doing. Look at the indices on health, access to health care. Look at the indices in terms of the poverty levels of our communities. Look at the indices in terms of how people perceive their own leaders. Then you start asking questions about how we chose and select and elect our leaders. And that cuts across the board. And we're not even getting into the bigger questions of how the international financial systems are skewed against us. And we have leaders who are not even competent enough to question those things, but use those same instruments to reduce the quality of life of our people. And yet, we talk about democracy. Now, does that suggest in any way that these military regimes will change anything? No, they don't. But I can, I mean, I had someone I considered special as a young person growing up, Thomas Sankara, whom I had to, I was lucky to have met, you know, uh, shortly before his, 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 his unfortunate assassination. Now, Leaders like that did not see what they were doing as a military coup for the sake of staging a coup. Mr. Eno, we only have one hour. You met Thomas Sankara? Yeah. <laughs> because I could do, we could do a whole bit about talking about Mr. <laughs> Sankara. Okay, we'll, we'll do that separately. But let's come back to what I'm trying to say here. Because we're talking about coups and the return of coups. You know... Those who stage these schools always come with this grandiose idea of, as we know here, wanting to stare back the ship of state and all of that. But now it's very clear. Times have changed. This is not the solution. Neither do these people have better ideas. But for those who claim to be democratically elected leaders, but are not willing to submit themselves to... The, 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 not just the criticism, but the, the critical questions that their people ask of them are more culpable to why we're having the coups than even the soldiers who stage the coups themselves. And that's why what's happened in Senegal is very unique. I, I was going to segue there. Um, we, Senegal is one of, one of those countries in Africa that have never experienced a coup d'etat. Yeah. And, and known for strong democratic values and, mm -hmm. and whatnot. At the time when Diomaye you know, got elected and, and, and became president, and at least right now we know he has uh, nominated um, Sasanko as his mm -hmm. prime minister, mm -hmm. it, it brought to my mind the question of young people. 
because we, with Senegal, at least I, I happened to be there. Mm -hmm. I even went to see Mr. Makisal, yeah. you know, before he left off. He refused to speak to us. No, no, it's okay. <laughs> he refused to speak to us, but, but former president, Gulag Jonathan, was there, and he actually got to talk to us about, you know, the concept of conceding, and that was some of the things that they had discussed yeah. in, that, in that meeting. When it comes to young people in Nigeria, I, I tried to draw a parallel with the young people I was looking at in Senegal and how gung-ho they were. It didn't feel like this just happened. It, fe it felt like this was a movement that they had stayed at. They had died for. I heard some people had died for this cause. I, uh, Mr. Diomaye Faye had been given trouble, good trouble, for a very long time. So and was I, so was Sonko. You know, I, I tried to, you know, put that together with the Nigerian young person who's very dissatisfied with his government and wants to, he wants a new government, wants a new life, a new governance that can help him out and make his life better. And I kept thinking about the resilience and how much sacrifice it takes for that to happen. Talk to us a bit about the young person in Nigeria and what lessons they can be getting from the Senegalese story. One is resilience. Resilience, resilience, resilience. Those guys you see are not, it's not that they were never tempted. They were. From their youngest of ages to their early professional careers, right up to the eve of the elections, Sonko was still being offered different perks. Not to support Jomai. No, it had nothing to do with Jomai. Because for that, everybody knew that if you go in that direction, you're wasting your time. But Sonko was even told, listen, just accept that we postpone the elections and you will come out of prison at a later time and then we organize the elections and you'll win. Oh, yes. Authoritatively. He said no. He told them no. He not only did he tell them no, he said... I will stay in prison and my party and my followers will win the elections. Now, when I talk about resilience, I'm not saying that Nigerian young people are not resilient. They are very resilient. But Nigerian youth, you don't need to follow all of these are political parties and big wigs. And I say this very clearly. Get your voices heard. Don't look for uh, donor money and support money. No, 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 no. You see the Senegalese guys who are doing this thing. Every Senegalese and 1,500 of them were arrested. Every one of those families that had a son or daughter arrested had money from the protesters on the streets. 100 francs, 200 francs, they would collect it and say, okay, this mother here, her son is in prison, they go and give her 5,000 naira. Say, mama, don't worry, we'll bring him back. Francs. Francs. <laughs> no, but, no, so when I say this, I'm not suggesting in any way that things, and I, I, I have to be very clear with you, the, 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 the rise of the obedient movement, which everybody says was driven by youth. Now, you have to understand that this does not have to transmit into going to join a political party or not joining. Sonko, Jomaifai, this thing was organic. It was very organic. And so from amongst them, those guys started building this movement. So young Nigerians will have to understand, we have elections coming up. It has to come to a point where all of the major political players will realize that young people are not going to follow me. So either you move yourself to follow them or they will move themselves to where you are and take over. Which is exactly what has happened in Senegal. I know the contexts are completely different. 
Senegal is coming from, if I look at it, culture, a very sophisticated place, a very sophisticated background. But young people are young people. You see the guys who did what they did in Senegal, they moved away from religion. They're very religious. But if you take the Senegalese, okay, 90, 90 plus percent Muslim, the movement, they are very prayerful. But if you look at the way Islam in Senegal is structured, it's almost like family units and the marabouts and all of that. Those guys, from Jumaifai to Sonko himself, none of the marabouts or the big Islamic families in Senegal today as a whole. Nope. But they pray, and they are very prayerful. But they cut that completely from their goals and focus as to what they want for their country. I mean, maybe you might be surprised. I am not one of those who believes that uh, moral decadence in Nigeria today is more prevalent among young people. It's more prevalent among the older ones. Yes. Isn't it? Far more. Far, far more. I mean, let somebody not blackmail young people to think that they are the problem. They are not. In fact, they are victims of a bigger problem. And that bigger problem is us. And I include, I mean, Kayla, in a few months I'm going to be 60 if I have to disclose my age. But truly, 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 the problem is older generation. And until that older generation admits that we have failed our younger generation, and that younger generation realizes that they have an even bigger responsibility because we have eaten our pies, and takes that front row and stops looking at, you know, it's fine, there are good things you can pick from morals. There are lots of parents who are doing a great job today. But the young people did not bring corruption to Nigeria. The, in fact, the young people today are even more Nigerian than the older ones. I think it comes back to, I told you about my little conversation once with the late Chief Ezefe about the basic truths about ourselves as a country. If the older generation starts admitting that we made certain mistakes, I don't, you don't need to apologize to young people if we don't have to do that, but let them start understanding that truly we missed the ball somewhere. Can you guys start understanding that we too are sorry? Mm. I, I think that's a good place to anchor it, but I know we can talk forever, <laughs> me and you. But <laughs> no, I want thanks, to, Kela. That no. is all the time that we have. I want to thank you so much, Don't Mr. Mention Fabrique, no, and you. for making all the time to speak with us on Political Paradigm. I know you have a lot of work ahead of you with the UN. I know. Congratulations I know. No, on that. I, I mean, that's fine. That's fine. But you know where to get me anytime. I do. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. Always a pleasure. Always a pleasure. We have been speaking to Mr. Frederick Eno the former special assistant to the late Moshu Dabiola, current uh, businessman with the United Nations, a consultant for the United Nations, and a former special advisor to the resident coordinator of the UN in Nigeria, journalist and pro-Africanist. Please join the conversation on channelstv.com. Leave your comments there respectfully, of course. And join us as we continue to ask until the accountability question is answered. I'm Kayla Megua. See you next time.